Uh, my name is Martin Hegelund. I'm very happy to welcome you to the fourth and final of our Frankie lectures, uh, which are being held in conjunction with the seminar on Heidegger's Being in Time. Uh, so for those of you who have not this, heard this before, I do want to mention that one of the great things about the format of the Frankie seminars is that you're allowed to uh, invite uh, distinguished guests who not only come and give a lecture, uh, as Professor Stephen Carroll would do for us now, but who also really spend a whole day here engaged in philosophical reflection and discussion. And as I thought would be the case, and as I'm very happy to report has been the case, uh, Professor Stephen Carroll has been a wonderful presence today here already, uh, engaging in that philosophical activity of asking for and giving reasons that he has spent much time reflecting on in his own philosophical writing. So it's wonderful to see that uh, commitment practiced and not just theorized. Um, so, so that's been truly wonderful. And uh, Stephen Crowley is one of the leading interpreters of, of Heidegger, and especially early Heidegger being in time. And one of his great contributions is precisely to uh, bring issues of rationality, normativity, reason giving to bear on a book such as Being in Time, where like several dominant ways of reading this book have seemed as very resistant to that sort of discourse. And Professor Crowell instead wants to show how there are great resources for Heidegger, not for rejecting reason, but for rethinking what the dynamic of reason is, what the uh, exigencies or challenges of engaging in and being committed to asking for and giving reasons are. And that's allowed him to put Heidegger in conversation with many of the most exciting uh, contemporary conversations in philosophy, also related to other people we've had here this semester, such as Robert Pippin and Robert Brandom. So it all makes great sense. Um, he's the author of two books of his own. Um, the first, Husserl, Heidegger, and the Space of Meaning, Paths Towards Transcendental Phenomenology. And uh, most recently, Normativity and Phenomenology in Husserl and Heidegger, which is really a treasure trove of great chapters on both Husserl and Heidegger that can be read, read on their own. Uh, or, but it also form a very compelling whole, so I really recommend that book. He is the Joseph and Joanna Nasru Mullen Professor of Philosophy at Rice University, uh, and we are extremely delighted to have him here, uh, have the chance to listen to and learn from him today, so please join me in welcoming Stephen Crowell. I, I need to begin with a word of apology and then a word of thanks. The apology is that, as you can hear, I'm uh, two weeks into a cold that I'm having trouble shaking. Uh, so my voice will be um, going in and out. Uh, the words of thanks uh, are due to Martin Hagland for the invitation to return to Yale and uh, meet with the students of whom uh, I was once one. And uh, it brings back a lot of memories. And Jensen Suter for handling all the uh, details of this visit. Um, it's been a delight. Uh, my uh, family goes back into these parts for a, a long ways, and I don't get up here that often uh, from Houston. Um, so every time I do, I, I really appreciate it. And to show my appreciation, I'm going to deliver a rather self-indulgent paper. Um, uh, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, it's called Methodological Atheism, an Essay in Second-Person Phenomenology. And uh, I begin in honor of the uh, translation of the final volume of Knosgaard's uh, great work, um, My Struggle, which is, uh, I, ha I haven't read a word of it, by the way, um, <laughs> but I do like the title. Uh, so that's my uh, section one, is my struggle. Today I want to explore the Heideggerian idea that commitment is necessary for intentionality, that is, for experiencing something as something. Understanding commitment requires a dip into second-person phenomenology, that is, experiencing oneself as the addressee of a normative claim. I will argue that the second-person phenomenology of commitment precludes identifying the addresser of the claim, and so entails methodological atheism. Put otherwise, while identifying an addresser is an option, doing so is an intentional act 
and so already presupposes commitment. As I see it, methodological atheism is what binds philosophy to the human condition, and so also to humanistic inquiry as distinct from science, theory, and worldview. Since phenomenology is central to my argument, it would behoove me to explain what it is. As this would leave me no time for the argument itself, however, I will indulge in a few autobiographical remarks that may suggest why I think phenomenological reflection is philosophically necessary. Phenomenological philosophy can be understood as a twist on Aristotle's idea of first philosophy as the attempt to specify what philosophical inquiry inquires into. As an undergraduate, I was absorbed by this irritating meta question, since it seemed to me that everything in the world had already been parceled out to other fields of inquiry. Eventually, I learned that two answers in historical sequence had been given, metaphysics and epistemology. Metaphysics inquires into being, not this or that entity, but the being of entities. However, Aristotelian metaphysics involves an ambiguity. The being of entities is identified with an entity, hotheos, but also with some basic feature of entities, the categories or forms that make a thing what it is. Epistemology, in contrast, following Kant, takes our knowledge of entities to be philosophy's theme. But here, the categorical conditions of possibility of knowledge seemed either nothing but cognitive processes studied by psychology, or else a new version of metaphysics, Hegel's absolute concept. I was at a loss. In this situation, the phenomenology of Husserl and Heidegger appealed to me. For them, philosophy thematizes meaning, zin, our experience of something as something. Such meaning is presupposed in both metaphysics and epistemology, that is, in any discussion of entities or our knowledge of them. This idea was also congenial since it linked philosophy tightly to other humanistic disciplines concerned with meaning. When I arrived at Yale as a graduate student in the mid-1970s, the philosophy department was, like most philosophy departments in the United States, in thrall to the philosophy of language. The ubiquity of courses on philosophy of mind and the resurgence of metaphysics were far in the future. In one sense, this was a boon, since language and meaning are obviously deeply imbricated. But two things gave me pause. First, meaning was understood mainly in terms of Frege's Sinnbedeutung dyad, the sense and reference of terms and sentences viewed as material for logical syntactics and semantics. Yes, there was the later Wittgenstein's idea of seeing as, but there was also his idea that philosophical questions are at bottom grammatical ones, which seemed quite alien to me. Second, and more troublingly, this was the heyday of Quine's two dogmas, which jettisoned meaning altogether, just old-fashioned metaphysical essence wedded to the word, in favor of a naturalistic pragmatism. To my worried mind, this again seemed to leave philosophy with nothing to do. The underlaborer conception held no appeal, and so there was little recourse but pursue the phenomenological path where linguistic meaning, a kind of intentional experience, shows up in a reflection on the correlation between intentional acts and intentional contents. At the time, Yale was also home to Derrida's challenge to phenomenology, his deconstruction of the metaphysics of presence, upon which phenomenology supposedly staked its claim. On this view, phenomenology's approach to meaning is compromised by its foundationalism. While intentional experience is temporal, and so our engagement with entities has an anticipatory or merely presumptive sense, Husserl held that our consciousness of such things gives itself with a kind of evidence that renders epistemic doubts about it otios. Derrida challenged this presence to self in the name of difference, the spacing that belongs to time, and renders such self-presence impossible. As Martin Hegelin puts the, uh, this point, quote, in spite of Husserl's assertions, the structure of retentional consciousness cannot be essentially different from the structure of representation, representation. 
If the meaning at issue in the intentional correlation is not epistemically secured through the evidence of reflection, then meaning, or the as, is always in play, undecidable, and phenomenological philosophy appears to be a literary art. Derrida's critique of phenomenology extended to Heidegger's superficially very different version, inquiry into the being of beings. Despite Heidegger's epistemic anti-foundationalism, Derrida sensed nostalgia for an ultimate meaning or truth of being that would eliminate the ambiguity in Aristotelian ontotheology. To me, this criticism told against the later Heidegger, but it too quickly dismissed Heidegger's phenomenological account of Dasein's understanding of being. Specifically, it did not fully appreciate the methodological atheism entailed by Heidegger's approach to the meaning of being. What then is methodological atheism? Uh, section two, methodological atheism and the phenomenological project. Distinguishing Heidegger's phenomenology from Husserl's and shielding it from both naturalistic and deconstructive suspicions about meaning is its embrace of second person phenomenology, a what he calls fundamental ethics evident in the categorical structure of commitment. Yet fundamental ethics is itself informed by a commitment Heidegger shares with Husserl, a commitment to metaphysical neutrality. For both, phenomenology thematizes meaning or intentionality and so suspends concern with the entities and their properties, remains neutral with regard to the questions of fact at issue in our various everyday and scientific practices. Because philosophy has no independent source of cognitive insight into such things, the project of phenomenological philosophy entails methodological atheism. Heidegger highlights this point in a lecture course from 1925 while taking a stand on the ambiguity in Aristotelian metaphysics. Having defined phenomenology as categorical intuition or the analytical description of intentionality in its a priori, he writes, quote, as long as phenomenology understands itself, it will adhere to this course of investigation against any sort of prophetism within philosophy and against any inclination to provide guidelines for life. Philosophical research is and remains atheism, which is why philosophy can allow itself the arrogance of thinking. If anybody knows where this quote, the arrogance of thinking, comes from, I would appreciate the reference. I thought it was Nietzsche, but I can't find it. For now, I note only two points about this passage. First, the atheism in question is methodological because it follows from phenomenology's commitment to neutrality. It's unconcerned with the existence of the entities whose givenness, being, or meaning it thematizes. For Heidegger, phenomenology is the true ground, he says, for research into the categories. It is transcendental inquiry into the being of beings. This means that the other side of Aristotelian metaphysics, inquiry into the highest entity, or hoteos, is not a proper topic for philosophy. Such inquiry can, of course, be undertaken, perhaps in theology, on the basis of a canonical tradition, perhaps even scientifically or comparatively, but it presupposes, Heidegger thinks, a phenomenology of religious life, the categorical structure of which is the concern of phenomenological reflection. This point is not limited to theology, of course. Introducing the passage just cited, Heidegger criticizes Husserl for failing to distinguish adequately between phenomenology and descriptive psychology, the study of consciousness as an entity, descriptive psychology. To understand phenomenology as psychology is to take the latter's categories as authoritative. And this, too, is a form of theism, as is any appeal to authoritative entities or sciences including the sciences of life. This idea underwrites Heidegger's claim that philosophy must avoid prophetism, the goal of providing guidelines for life. These phrases are drawn from Heidegger's debate with Weltanschauung philosophy, the project of constructing action-guiding pictures of the meaning of life by speculatively extending the findings of the natural, social, and human sciences to their asymptotic point of unification. 
This too is theological, since it helps itself to contingent premises about the way things actually are. But what's the point of philosophy if it refuses to pronounce on how we ought to live? This brings us to the second point of interest in the passage, namely Heidegger's claim that methodological atheism allows philosophy the arrogance of thinking. Here, arrogance might be understood as autonomy. Philosophy is its own thing and need not take dictation from other cultural forms, such as science or religion. However, one might also understand arrogance as arrogation, seizing, expropriating, usurping, or assuming, which suggests that such thinking presumptively appropriates for itself something that is not its own, treating it as, as though it were. Methodological atheism on this view would serve to conceal philosophy's theft of something to which it has no right, passing itself off as autonomous, though it lives from the exploitation of its other. This was Emmanuel Levinas's take on the phenomenological project. For Levinas, too, phenomenological philosophy is essentially atheism. To think about the intentional structure of meaning requires that, uh, that the thinker exercise a kind of freedom that can close itself off to the claims of the world, as he says, all the way to atheism. But such ontological arrogation is only the first step, since for Levinas, meaning is sustained by a forgotten condition that exceeds freedom and chastens thinking's arrogant presumption of reducing everything other to intentional content. Levinas names this condition the face of the other, the face is an interdictory claim on freedom that escapes intentional correlation, and so also the ontological categories that shape it. Interdiction is his version of fundamental ethics, grounded neither in reason nor in an ontology of the good. It is worth noting that in a reversal of Heidegger's decision concerning the ambiguity of Aristotelian metaphysics, Levinas calls ethics first philosophy. He means that categorial inquiry into the being of entities depends on an avowal of an authoritative command, hotheos, that shatters the arrogance of thinking. Less colorfully, phenomenology lives from a metaphysical condition that cannot be recognized under the constraints of its methodologically atheist approach to intentionality. Here we get a glimpse of second-person phenomenology, since Levinas's argument turns on a normative claim made on the thinker, which situates her as a you accusative. The face of the other is not grasped cognitively in perception, but as what, quote, calls my freedom into question. And this experience of being called into question is the theme of second-person phenomenology. Uh, uh, by way of orientation, consider what distinguishes Levinas' second-person phenomenology from Stephen Darwall's exemplary analysis of the second-person standpoint. Namely, his objection uh, to Darwall's argument that being morally called into question presupposes the normative felicity condition of symmetrical authority between addresser and addressee. For Darwall, such symmetry is necessary if the other's claim on me is to be valid. For Levinas, however, the experience of acknowledging the claim is basic, and so is prior to the question of validity. The other's command first inducts me into normative space, the space of meaning, where symmetrical rights and obligations can be, can be negotiated and are negotiated without end. Such negotiation can be summed up in Derrida's claim that justice is not deconstructible. However, I shall say no more about questions of validity, justification, and the political, since I want to focus on the prior issue of whether second-person phenomenology requires, as both Derrida and Levinas in different ways insist, a break with ontology, the methodologically atheist phenomenology of meaning. I will argue that it does not. Put positively, the second-person character of Heidegger's phenomenology of commitment remains atheistic and so preserves the arrogance, or the autonomy of thinking. Uh, I will frame the argument by, uh, excuse me, I, I will frame the argument by idiosyncratically appropriating the distinction found in the analytic literature uh, 
between a normativity first account of reasons and a reasons first account of normativity. Kant's ethics is an example of a reasons first approach. Moral norms are normative, that is valid or binding, because they are grounded in pure practical reason. Uh, Levinas's fundamental ethics, in contrast, exemplifies a normativity first approach. Reasons and rationality are possible for us living beings only when we have acknowledged a normative check on our freedom. Husserl, like Kant, adopts a reasons first account of the normativity constitutive of all intentional content, while Heidegger's uh, phenomenology of commitment follows a normativity first path. Unlike Levinas's metaphysical version, however, Heidegger's remains methodologically atheist and so has affinities with Darwall's reasons first approach. Understanding commitment then requires that we consider the difference between Darwall and Levinas in somewhat more detail. So in section three, I uh, it's, uh, take up Darwall's reasons first approach to second person phenomenology. According to Darwall, second person reasons are valid, valid normative claims that we make on one another's conduct and will. And his question is this, what interpersonal conditions must be in place in order for second person reasons to exist? As a first approximation, he writes, quote, what makes a, second person, uh, what makes a reason second personal is that it is grounded in de jure authority relations that an addresser hold, takes to hold between him and his addressee, end quote. Second person reasons thus depend on the presupposition that you have the authority to command my will. What can give you that authority? Darwell's analysis of the second person standpoint is meant to ar uh, answer this question. Quite generally, the other's normative claim on me can yield a valid second person reason only if the other and I share, quote, a common second personal authority competence and responsibility simply as free and rational agents. The authority to issue binding commands then and to hold someone accountable for carrying them out must be shared. The, de the demand for symmetrical authority arises from Darwell's focus on the validity of second person reasons. If there are second, uh, valid second person reasons, then certain normative felicity conditions must obtain. Absent such conditions, a command lacks the power to constitute a valid agent relative reason for me to act. But even if this is true, it does not rule out that a command could have other kinds of power, other ways of binding. Darwell identifies one such case, namely coercion, a command that rests on some non-normative power. But are all asymmetrical commands instances of coercion? And if not, might such a command be a condition for our ability to entertain second person reasons? Levinas's phenomenology purports to identify a command that is both normative and asymmetrical, one that constitutes a condition on our taking up the second person standpoint and more generally clarifies how we become attuned to the normative force of reasons, second person or otherwise. Since Levinas's view involves a distinction between second person phenomenology and the second person standpoint, I will consider two phenomenologically telling aspects of the latter, its holism and its character as a performative attitude. Second person reasons are agent relative. They can appear only to one who occupies what Jürgen Habermas calls the performative, at, quote, the performative attitude of a person taking part in interaction. My indignation at being trod upon differs from anger at your being the cause of my pain because indignation includes consciousness of, quote, the violation of an underlying normative expectation that is valid, end quote, not just for the two of us, but ultimately for all competent actors. And such consciousness is possible only within the second person standpoint, quote, the perspective one assumes in addressing practical thought or speech to or acknowledging address from another. That this is a performative attitude is indicated by two phenomenological features. First, uh, and this is Darwell's uh, quote now, uh, the second person stance is a version of the first person standpoint, end quote. That is a version of the I's performative character uh, 
which Darwal explicates in terms of Fichte's notion of self-positing. Second, quote, what the second person stance excludes is the third person perspective, end quote, where one regards oneself agent neutrally rather than the uh, addresser or addressee of a normative claim. This illuminates the holistic nature of the second person standpoint. The performance in question may be conceived as a move in a game whose rules are already in place and to engage in which one must be second person competent. What makes the second person standpoint game-like is the fact, as Darwell points out, that it consists of an interdefinable circle of roles, addresser, dressee, skills, or competence, and standing, authority, each of which implies all the rest and can be justified only within the circle. The idea that second person reasons entail symmetrical relations of authority thus arises within the circle of concepts because these concepts define the kind of entity who can play the game, namely persons. And if, as he said, Darwell says, the very concept of person is itself a second person concept, the essential features of personhood are also defined, free and rational. I cannot have a second person reason to do something if my will is responsive only to causes or to motives that have no normative force. That is, I must be free. Uh, nor can I have such reasons, as opposed to there being reasons for me to do something, unless I can be moved by reasons as reasons. That is, I must be rational. Thus, whether I issue a claim or am the recipient of one, the capacities that matter are shared between addresser and addressee. The claim succeeds in providing a second person reason only because the roles of addresser and addressee are defined by a standing that both share, the authority to address second person claims. In this notion of authority, we can recognize both the reason's first character of Darwall's argument for the necessary symmetry between players and also his commitment to methodological atheism. Second personal reasons exist only from the, standpoint, uh, from the second person's standpoint in which I am either the addresser or the addressee of a normative claim. The roles are symmetrical because we must presuppose, quote, that those we address can guide themselves by a reciprocal recognition of the second personal reasons we address and our authority to address them, end quote. Thus, the normativity of a claim derives from its rationality, and its authority presupposes a recognition of the autonomy of both addresser and addressee. As in Heidegger, this condition brings methodological atheism in its train. Darwell elucidates this uh, uh, claim uh, uh, that I just went through. Darwell elucidates this claim with what he calls Fichte's point. Quote, we can be held morally responsible only for what we can hold ourselves responsible for by making moral demands of ourselves from the perspective of one free and rational agent among others. If that is so, the symmetrical authority of addresser and addressee belongs to the game because rational beings are interchangeable. A rational being cannot demand of another rational being anything that the latter could not demand of herself. I am not accountable to another for anything that I cannot demand of myself. Darwell reinforces Fichte's point by considering Samuel Pufendorf's take on theological voluntarism. Though on the voluntaristic picture, quote, moral obligations are all ultimately owed to God, end quote, Pufendorf's point is that an obligation can arise, quote, only if God addresses us as rational agents. God can hold us responsible only if God can assume that we can, quote, hold ourselves responsible in our own reasoning and thought, end quote. Otherwise, the command could only move us by fear of sanctions that might coerce compliance. Uh, but Darwell goes further, claiming that, quote, holding ourselves responsible in our own reasoning and thought requires that we must be able to take up a second person standpoint on ourselves and hold ourselves accountable from that point of view. But why should this be? Why can I not hold myself accountable for something, say, an obligation to help those in need, without seeing myself as belonging to a community of free and rational beings? 
if being able to take up a second person standpoint on myself simply means that it is possible for me to do so, this does not mean that a normative command, say God's, can reach me only if I do take up such a standpoint. Bufendorf holds that, quote, each agent forms a moral community with God alone, with God being accountable to no one, end quote. Thus, it might be true that one can form such a community with God only if one can hold oneself accountable to oneself before God. And it might also be true that, quote, one will have this capacity only if one is also capable of entering into a community of mutually accountable persons, end quote. But it does not seem to follow that entering into a moral community with God alone requires that one actually consider oneself from the second person standpoint. It could be that the moral community with God makes taking up the second person standpoint on oneself possible. The alternative would be to say that God's command can obligate me only if I stand in a second person relation of symmetrical authority with God. Such a view does away with moral asymmetry, to be sure, but it also does away with God, which seems to be Darwall's point. The presuppositional analysis of the second person standpoint is methodologically atheist. It can acknowledge no gods, no persons with an asymmetrical authority to issue valid commands. But this does not mean that there can be no gods at all, addressers of a command for which I hold myself responsible without presupposing that I have reciprocal authority to command such gods in turn. Since this is a phenomenological point, it is not constrained by the presuppositions of the second person standpoint. Darwell himself acknowledges this distinction. While his analysis primarily concerned with the performative commitments of persons as players in the game of giving and asking for reasons, he also recognizes the limited scope of the game. It is something that we assume or enter into. The second person standpoint is neither exhaustive of our lives, hence of our phenomenology, nor automatic. Somehow, out of a wider field of experience, it requires uptake. There's nothing necessary about the game, or rather, if there is a certain necessity to it, that necessity must lie outside the game, lest the latter prove only a game, quote, no more than rational, rationally optional, or worse, illusory. If the second person standpoint is a practice into which we must be inaugurated, this entry move can be understood in two ways. On the one hand, we can approach it as Darwall and Habermas do in terms of developmental psychology and the history of moral enlightenment. On the other hand, we can approach it phenomenologically as Levinas and Heidegger do through a reflection on experiences that make uptake of the second person standpoint categorically intelligible. Such phenomenology need take no issue with Darwell's reasons first approach to the necessary conditions for valid second person reasons. But if Levinas is right that the second person standpoint originates in an experience of obligation that constitutes a being as rational, notions like freedom and rationality must also be understood in a normativity first way. Darwell regularly appeal, appeals to phenomenological evidence, that is, to descriptions that uncover what is essential to the meaning constituted in various kinds of experience. For instance, to say that the second person standpoint is a performative attitude means that I experience claims as normative and do not merely consider them. Understood phenomenologically, the presuppositions of such an attitude are the intentional implications or horizons of second person practices which make the meaning experienced in such practices what it is for the, the agent so engaged. And if the agent, the person, is constituted by engaging in second person practices, then the person, phenomenologically considered, must be intelligible to herself as the one whose life, be it otherwise what it may, is normatively at stake in what she is doing. The primary phenomenological evidence Darwall draws upon, however, is a description of reactive attitudes. Such attitudes, for instance, indignation that someone has stepped on my toe, or resentment at the absence of an apology, intentionally imply the experience of the violation of a normative claim that I expect the other to acknowledge, 
because I too have the authority to make such a claim, an authority which the other must acknowledge because it belongs to us as free and rational agents. Of course, reactive attitudes do not exhaust moral phenomenology, but by focusing on them, Darwal's approach uh, foregrounds cases in, what, in which I make claims on another. We might wonder, however, whether reactive attitudes must move in this self to other direction. Here, Levinas's moral phenomenology proves instructive. Section four, uh, Levinas's normativity first approach to second person phenomenology. For Levinas, the experience of being commanded is the experience of an interdiction on a freedom that I already possess. Freedom is the living being's power to remain the same in interacting with its environment, paradigmatically by assimilating that environment in the form of nourishment. Such freedom is not defined in terms of rational self-determination and includes nothing uh, normative in its uh, exercise. The interdiction on such freedom, the command, uh, thou shalt not kill, is the inception of the normative, the feeling of obligation. Because I thus initially appear as you accusative, Levinas's phenomenology is second personal, but it is not an instance of the second person standpoint. While the living being can assimilate everything other to itself through alimentation, labor, and conceptual comprehension, I'm just going through Levinas's view here, the addresser, the capital O other, is experienced as resisting such assimilation by its height. The metaphor of height means that this experience is normative, but the normativity involved is not mediated by a presupposition of symmetry. Quote, I, you, these are not individuals of a common concept, he says. If that is so, then I cannot initially claim an equal status to command the other based on a shared set of characteristics, being free and rational or being conspecifics. And so I cannot exchange places with the addresser. In my singularity, I do not have any resources for making normative claims. I learn what the normative is through the other's command. As Levinas expresses it, the other's command is teaching, an experience of something that could not, in principle, be myutically drawn out of the living being's freedom. We are thus returned to a version of theological volunt voluntarism. But Levinas's account does not conform to Pufendorf's point, namely that for God's command to constitute an obligation, it must be addressed to me as free and rational being. Levinas argues that it is through the uptake of the command that I become a being whose freedom is rational. But it might initially appear that the asymmetry between addresser and addressee means that my uptake of the command can be based only on asymmetrical power relations, the fear of sanctions. For Levinas, however, the command is the end of powers. These are quotes. If the freedom that characterizes life is grounded in the experience of the I can, my power to appropriate the world, then the interdict on such experience transforms my factual power into normative powerlessness. The interdict is not a violent imposition on my freedom, but attests to the impotence of violence. If I hear the command, experience the other as a height, I can still exercise my murderous freedom, but I do not thereby eliminate the obligation not to kill. This is just what normative binding amounts to. Even if I violate the command, I'm still bound by it. The experience of this powerlessness initiates me into normative space. It might still appear that I could only be coerced into acknowledging the binding character of the command. What other motive do I have for acknowledging the other's authority? In addressing this question, Levinas's second person phenomenology diverges radically from Darwell's account of the second person standpoint. For unlike Pufendorf's God, the other has neither the authority to command nor sanctions to impose. The command rests on nothing but itself. It is, he says, the first word. How then is the attitude in which I hear the command, react to it, take it up, to be described phenomenologically. 
Levinas names this attitude desire, a reactive attitude that does not address a claim to the other, but acknowledges a claim received from the other. As a reactive attitude, desire cannot be understood in terms of pro-attitudes toward things that will satisfy the various hungers that beset the living being. Such things are, of course, goods and give the living being reasons to pursue them. But the living being does not pursue them as its reasons. It has them, but does not act on them as reasons. Desire, in contrast, embraces the ethical resistance to life's freedom which, quote, liberates freedom from the arbitrary. By calling freedom into question, the interdict does not, quote, limit but promotes my freedom by arousing my goodness, opening another path, another standard by which freedom can measure itself. As in Plato, then, Levinasian desire aims beyond being, beyond the wants and needs of the living being toward the ideatu agatu, or the idea of the good. In desire, freedom recognizes its moral vocation, and while entry into normative space is thus deontological, the desire it arouses spreads it itself across the whole world of things. But better than being, while being itself is itself Levinas does not unambiguously embrace the methodological atheism that for Heidegger defines a phenomenological inquiry as meaning, a refusal to attribute metaphysical 
the shame fe freedom feels for itself, end quote. This and nothing else is the phenomenon of welcoming the other. Yet, as we have seen, shame does not abase freedom, but elevates it, introducing freedom into the pos to the possibility of measuring itself against what is better than being, the dimension of the ideal that arises with my desire for goodness. This may sound arcane, but such ideality, form, uh, a form of normativity, is ubiquitous in our intentional life. It is a condition on meaning, on encountering something as something. Husserl, for instance, describes how any current perceptual experience is pervaded by normative anticipations of what subsequent perceptions must reveal if the current perception is veridical. That is, if the perceived thing is as it is taken to be. Without such normative anticipations, further experience could not confirm or disconfirm my current one, but could only replace it with another. Heidegger expands this analysis of perceptual meaning and arrives with Levinas at the ethical ground of reason, the second personal phenomenon of conscience. Beginning with our practical engagement in the world, Heidegger argues that things can show up meaningfully, that is, as what they are, hammers, nails, lumber, only if I'm sensitive to that their suitability for the task. Suitability, a normative notion, is relative to what I'm trying to do with them, say, make a birdhouse. Whether a certain hammer is good or bad for the job is determined by what a birdhouse is ideally supposed to be. But what determines what I'm trying to do? Heidegger denies that appeal to what Searle calls intention in action is enough, since such intentions depend on that for the sake of which I am doing what I'm doing, that is, on what I'm trying to be. Following course guard, we may call this my practical identity. For instance, if I'm acting for the sake of being a carpenter, if being a carpenter is my practical identity, then my technical manipulation of tools and materials that eventuates in a leaky box with large nails sticking out will be judged a failure. Uh, but if I'm acting for the sake of being an artist in the style of art povera, the very same manipulations with the same result may be judged a great success. The phenomenological point is that things do not possess their ideality in themselves. For Heidegger, it comes to them from my commitment my caring about whether I succeed or fail at, at what it is or means to be whatever it is that I'm trying to be. In being committed to teaching, for instance, what it means to be a teacher is at issue. That is, I measure myself against the good in respect of teaching. While this measure is initially found in the norms of teaching that belong to my historical community, such norms provide no recipes. They are themselves at issue in my commitment to teaching. Acting in their light, I take a stand on what they should be, and so what I do is exemplary of what I take teaching to mean. Commitment is thus oriented toward a good beyond being, and only if I'm committed, that is, bind myself to the measure, care about succeeding or failing at what I'm trying to be, can I encounter things as succeeding or failing at, what, at being what they are supposed to be. This, in a nutshell, is the argument for the first claim I introduced at the outset. Commitment is a necessary condition on intentionality and meaning. <coughs> Excuse me. Commitment is neither a function of my rationality nor of my animal life. No horse is committed to being a horse, nor can I be committed to being alive. I just am alive, and I can try to stay that way. For Heidegger, commitment belongs to the performative character of my being. The being who can say I is neither a natural substance nor a rational subject, but a being, quote, in whose being that very being is an issue for it. This is a phenomenological point whose evidence lies in an experience that teaches me who I am, the call of conscience. For Levinas, as we saw, conscience is a second personal phenomenon. Can the same be said for Heidegger? For Levinas, conscience is the shame freedom feels for itself precisely as freedom, and so is not tied to anything I have done. For Heidegger, too, the call of conscience neither warns nor reproves, 
uh, and does not invoke any antecedent law or ought. Those are quotes. While it does give me to understand my guilt, schuld, this understanding is independent of any practical identity. But just for this reason, the call might seem to lack the character of a command, and so also the normative force that Levinas takes to belong to the command as arche, or principle. Indeed, it might well appear that Heideggerian conscience is not a second person phenomenon at all, but this appearance is deceiving. First, the call, guilty, does have the structure of a command. Highlighting the connection between schuldig and verantwortlich, Heidegger interprets the call to mean that I am responsible for taking over being a ground, Grundsein übernehmen. As throne, I am delivered over to grounds over which I have no power, the non-normative causes and inclinations that move the living being. But since my being is precisely at issue, I stand before such factic grounds as before a choice. I'm unable to choose the inclinations or motivations I have, but neither do they necessitate what I do. In conscience, I learn that I must take over, that is, assume the status of being a ground. Since the call reaches the sort of entity who can be only performatively, this must is experienced in the you accusative. You must take over being a ground. If Dasein uh, is originally the addressee of a command, then we stand before two final questions. What is the phenomenological meaning of being a ground or commitment, and who commands? Heidegger's answer shows that despite the call's independence from any prevailing law or ought, it is normative in Levinas's sense. Being a ground cannot mean that I'm the absolute foundation of myself. Since I find myself already inclined in various ways, I never have power over my being from the ground up, as Heidegger says. Further, taking over being a ground, assuming the status of a ground, cannot simply be to acknowledge what inclines me. Inclinations need no such acknowledgment. Instead, it is to possibilize them, another term from Heidegger, to consider them not only for what they are, but in light of what is best in regard to what I'm committed to being. In conscience, as Heidegger explains in Vom Wesen des Grundes, the you must directs me beyond being toward the uh, idea of the good, the idea to agatu. Thus, quote, to be a ground is to consider the givens of my situation in normative light, to consider whether their claims ought to be embraced or rejected as my reasons. If that is so, then my response to the call, commitment, has the phenomenological structure of Levinasian desire for goodness. I take responsibility for the good or meaning at issue in what I am trying to be. That is, for the normative force of the reasons for which I act. Thus, conscience, the call to take over being a ground, is the phenomenological origin of justification, accounting for myself by way of reasons. If to take over being a ground is to treat my wants and needs in light of what is best, that is, as potentially justifying reasons, then my response to the call is apologia, responsibility for reasons, is answerability to others for what I take to be best. As in Levinas, then, reason is ori originally reason giving. But even if we can understand the call of conscience as a command that introduces me uh, to normative space and so makes the space of reasons and intentionality possible, is it really a second person phenomenon? Who is the addresser? Heidegger specifically denies that the it who calls is someone else who is with me in the world. And he goes so far as to say that, quote, the impossibility of making the caller more definite is a positive feature of the call. Finally, he describes the call as coming from me, yet from beyond me. Der Ruf kommt aus mir und doch über mich. In this passage, from me means that the call belongs phenomenologically to the first person. I myself. From beyond me, in turn, signifies that the mode of the first person at issue is the you accusative, being an addressee. 
The call addresses me in a way that exceeds all my projects, my practical identities, and so exceeds whatever self I have performatively achieved. We might charitably interpret this beyond as the normative height Levinas attributes to the face of the other. However, Heidegger also claims that, quote, the caller is Dasein itself in its uncanniness, end quote. Can we accept this identification of the addresser as I myself, thereby removing conscience from the field of second person phenomenology? On phenomenological grounds, I think we must hold fast to the second personal character of the call and following Heidegger's own insistence on the impossibility of making the caller more definite, understand the phenomenon of conscience as attesting to the fact that second person phenomenology must remain methodologically atheist neutral with regard to the addresser. It thereby loses nothing of its command character or its normativity. What is essential to the call is experiencing myself as you accusative. And naming the addresser will be a subsequent intentional act that already rests on my commitment. This was the second claim I promised to address at the outset. Of course, much more needs to be said, but since I've gone on too long already, allow me to conclude by circling back to Derrida. In his elaborate meditations on Kierkegaard, Levinas, and Heidegger in The Gift of Death, Derrida arrives at the issue that concerns us. Quote, well, as soon as, this, quote, as soon as a structure of conscience exists, that is, as soon as I have within me, thanks to the invisible word as such, a witness that others cannot see and who is at the same time other than me and more intimate with me than myself, then there is what I call God. There is what I call God in me. It happens that I call myself God, a phrase that is difficult to distinguish from God calls me, for it is on such a condition that I can call myself or be called in secret. This, I take it, is an echt phenomenological description. The call that informs my commitment, my being a ground, brings methodological atheism with it, since any intentional act in which I identify the addresser will be secretly aporetic. To say that God calls me is to call myself God. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions or brick bats, tomatoes, whatever, um, if you have any. Stephen. So, Steve, just a question about how you're understanding the Levinasian point. Yeah. Points. Uh, I was so I was a little unclear how a desire was coming in. Um, is the thought that uh, unless I've been addressed uh, by another, by the face of the other, I can't have desires, or I can't have desires of a certain kind, or uh, what was the thought there? Yeah, so, yeah, it's, yeah. It, he distinguishes sharply between desires and needs, and the needs are the satisfactions of a lack, yeah. something that I'm hungry or whatever. Um, so we talk about it, that as a desire for food, but he calls it need. And uh, uh, what, uh, what characterizes desire is the suspension of that need and an orientation toward the good. So in other words, uh, when, I'm, um, when I recognize that uh, this, my, my um, wanton freedom, so to speak, has been um, restricted in this way through this uh, interdict, the command that I take to be normative. Freedom is uh, set off in another direction, the name of which he calls desire. And he correlates that with uh, the kind of good that uh, he is using the Platonic language is beyond being. Uh, it's what things should be the best, that kind of uh, thought. And he, he, his claim is that, that it's this kind of desire responding to a restriction on my needs that introduces me into the very idea of something, in this sense, better than being, how things should be. 
and that's what I desire. In particular, that, in particular, in the sense that my freedom uh, be directed in that that way rather than to uh, quantum satisfaction. So the desire is that one. If I'm understanding this right, it's that one be good. That it's that I be good. That I be good. Sorry, yeah. I. It's yeah. That I be good. Yeah. So, but, so, yeah, I have to, yeah. so you might think, well, you know, just very sort of common sense thought. Uh, uh, there's nothing I need right now, let's suppose. I'm not hungry, I'm not thirsty. But it might be nice uh, to take a walk. Yeah. And so I form a desire to take a walk. The object is just to take a walk or to see the sunset or whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and it's hard to see how any state like that requires the address of another. Uh, OK, but now what you've got is, well, it's not just any old desire like that. It's a desire that one be, that I be good in some way. So it's a thought that, um, and it's, it does actually seem to me intuitive that, um, well, obviously, there's a difference between sort of ordinary desires or Experiences or for certain states or whatever it is, and wanting to be good or to be better oneself, uh, that requires some notion of uh, a different sort of scale of, of goodness. Uh, I, I guess I'm still not quite seeing why that would require. I mean, it's, it's yeah, like I've got to have some practical identity or some sense of. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we could go back to taking a walk. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess his thought is, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think my way into the thoughts of others, but um, it seems to be that there's a difference between uh, the way animals move. They move, as it were, to satisfy a need. And uh, when we take a walk, there's more than that. And uh, so that correlate the more, the higher calls it the more in being, it's, it's the meaning. You know, we, have, we, we, we can't get away from things meaning something to us. So we take a walk and, and, and it's part of uh, something I'm trying to be, so to speak. And uh, so it's that dimension that he's trying to capture, I think, in um, the, that difference. And, uh, 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 if if we if we just focus on walking as moving somewhere, then uh, right, uh, or satisfying an itch to walk, um, then that will be uh, on the need side. But if he maybe this is stipulative, he's just claiming that there is this uh, attribute of us, this capacity that we have that I'm going to call desire to. Uh, as it were, make tracks in the world somehow. And it's and introducing us into that holological space is the weird term that the Schultz used, um, is something that uh, he thinks is not possible without this kind of normative restriction on my freedom. That's the basic argument. And uh, uh, that goes back to me. Right, that that if that that teaches me, on his view, that teaches me something. This idea of shame for freedom as freedom as it has been introduced me, and that we can call that the realm of being or what is, introduces me to something that is other than being or better than being, um, and puts me on looking to that kind of measure. What you know, I want to take a really good walk, something like that. It's like more, I want to be a good walker. Well, that's certainly yeah. part of it. I yeah. mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the point about commitment and intentionality, I want to be a good walker. Yeah, I want to do walking in, in an Eric's way, right. you know, yeah. and be excellent at it, yeah. um, which uh, means that I'm conscious of a standard between uh, a normative standard that uh, distinguishes between uh, good and bad walking. Um, and that's an interesting capacity that we have. So I was 
just say more about the sort of philosophical status of the quasi-developmental story that Levinas tells. Because, you know, you might think in Kant there's a, there's a moral pedagogy, we have to learn to develop our capacity for practical reason, but it's a, that's a kind of like empirical story and we don't need it potentially to tell the story about the relationship between practical reason and inclination. But it's really important for Levinas, it seems, that something interrupts me and that yeah. there's, I mean, I don't know if it's a temporal progression, but there's something like a before and after, and certainly whatever the other teaches me through that relation is something I couldn't have taught myself. So I just wondered if you could say how we're supposed to understand Some people that. are actually, like, fair to cats, uh, Texas and m is writing on, on uh, Levinasian take on uh, what you call moral development and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. I actually have no real idea about that. I mean, to me, um, the, the interdict is present phenomenologically as conscience. That's, I, I, that's my Heideggerian view. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so when does conscience emerge, right? And under what conditions? Um, I don't know. Uh, it just to clarify, I'm not. I wasn't meaning to ask what's the Levinasian story about infant development or something like that. Yeah, I but, that. yeah but yeah. more like, what do we? How do we make sense of this of developmental stories that are philosophical rather than? Yeah, I've been trying to figure this out. You know, I mean, uh, 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 let's put it this way. I mean, a, a phenomenological like pat answer would be. We're sitting here talking to each other. It's always already happened, you know. Um, and uh, there's something to that. I mean, I, and, and maybe some other kind of developmental story can be told. But uh, uh, if you try to make sense, and I'm dealing only here with the totality of the okay? If you try to make sense of it, it has the same structure as uh, being in time in a certain way, because. Then he goes through all of these seemingly independent um, prior conditions, or you know, conditions of the living being, and then we sort of suddenly find ourselves, you know, in houses, putting our stuff away and that stuff, and all of these the labor, and all of this is supposed to, as it were, prepare the way for the other. But it turns out that it's already presupposed. It. So I can't say that that that's a developmental story. Um, he has some side issues in the, uh, uh, some, some paragraphs that are sort of screwed about totality and infinity, talking about how this is the transcendental philosophy, trying to find the conditions for a given condition. But he's going to let the empirical instances do the work, whereas most of the time in transcendental philosophy, they're immediately categorized or something. So that's a key passage for trying to figure out why he uses this language that Really, uh, there's nothing uh, sequential about it, right. and, um, but it's really hard to unpack. That's helpful. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think this follows directly on Francis' question uh, because it's both like sort of question about letting us and what you take to be a value of that and how it relates to read Heidegger. Because it seems like in the Nazi picture, there's sort of a triple layer cake, as it were. You know, there's like the non-normative freedom of the living being, which he calls sort of freedom, freedom to satisfy your wants and needs. And then there's this interdiction on that freedom, which is what you call normativity. And then there's a third layer, which is like rationality. Uh, so uh, first, I wonder like how you make sense of that picture and what, if anything, you think is philosophically compelling about that way of doing it, uh, thinking about it. And, but that's, then that's related them to how you're reading uh, conscience normativity in Heidegger because it still seems like uh, uh, there are on your account non-normative inclinations of Dasein mm -hmm. that can act as causes or be taken up as reasons. So there seems to be like, rather than that like all of this is understood in light of for the sake of that is already in place for you to be Dasein. So I don't know what the picture is. Like that, 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 yeah. that, that, that uh, is there like a separation between 
the desires, my desires as a living being and my commitments as a spiritual being. Uh, I think a separation could be made uh, because uh, the capacity to for spiritual freedom, to use your uh, yeah. Yeah. language, uh, uh, can break down. Uh, that is to say, some people, uh, let's just as human beings, um, revert to states in which they're no longer capable of being uh, acting for the sake of anything. But are they docile then? I don't want to get stipulated. I would say no. I, I don't think the, you know infants are docile. Right, and you, so, so then if you break down that way, you're not Dasein. Yeah, and so at that point, whatever the living being has in regard to causes and inclinations are no longer normatively guided. But then there's a sort of breakdown that you want to say is necessary for becoming Dasein too. So I'm just That's the, the call, the, that, that the breakdown of anxiety is not the breakdown of psychosis or right. uh, something else. But, but yeah, uh, as to uh, uh, this Layer cake model yeah, yeah. Which is, is uh, something we're not supposed to want. Yeah. Right. Um, well, it's also, it's things that don't tell you all that's something wrong. Uh, yeah. I mean, we can we can talk about things one after another. We can't talk about everything all at once. But right. uh, 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 I think let it, uh, well, if, if if we stick with the Iberian case, yeah. there's no. Uh, drives and inclinations and causes that uh, enter into our experience that are not taken up normatively, I would say. And I think that's the same for Levinas, too. Though he has a different view of freedom. He identifies freedom with the living being. And, uh, and it's the restraint on that freedom that needs to be... Um, Freedom is a freedom to appropriate and remain the same in the other, in, in the world. And uh, the living being has that. What it needs is uh, an orientation beyond uh, that satisfaction of Selbsterhaltung or whatever. Um, but, but, but I may have done the question. I think it's another question. If it's always already happened, what's, what's the meaning of the language of entering into the space of reason, uh, entering into normative space? What's the status of that sort of diffusion? Uh, the status of that is that uh, uh, we're talking not here about uh, normativity, uh, the uh, phenomenology of the origin of reason. We're talking about the origin of the second person standpoint. I have to be taught about all this uh, free and equal stuff. And uh, so that's where the developmental story from Habermas and uh, Professor Darwal um, comes in. And, uh, uh, in Darwell's book, he's, he's saying, well, look, I mean, how can, what, I mean, the real challenge to this is uh, 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 we want something more out of the second person standpoint than for it to be a merely psychologically necessary, you know, state. We want these reasons to have, uh, I won't call them metaphysical significance, but uh, they, want, they have to have validity. If it's only a psychological state, then they ultimately don't don't have the kind of validity that they claim, and persons aren't what they claim to be, and so on. And uh, he has some very interesting things to say about how one might construct an argument, um, sounded rather transcendental, you know, uh, as to why uh, there was some necessity to this game that, um, that uh, rendered it more than um, optional or illusory. Um, and I'm just uh, suggesting another. But, but in terms of how to ex explaining this entering into, um, the, both Habermas and Darwal take up you know, the history of moral consciousness, so to speak. I mean, uh, uh, it returns to sociology and developmental psychology and, 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 and do that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Um, but I'm saying there's another kind of question about uh, because I would ultimately say that the ability to do uh, developmental psychology and the history of moral enlightenment um, depends on what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah, the point is that the second person standpoint is, is, is not the same as entering into the space of reasons. That's a difference. I think I have a question about the same point about this uh, dimension of the entering into or this difference of the second person standpoint and uh, 
kind of second personal relation that you are describing because I thought that somehow you nicely showed that somehow, um, I mean, well, that's the way, one way I took it, that yeah. somehow there's a dimension of being caught into a normative order that is not already of the form of having a claim toward another of being claimed the form. Yeah. So we are already in this kind of game where, where we are reciprocal in a reciprocal uh, relation where we uh, where we have to presuppose the authority and the competence of the other and exchange reasons of this sort. But uh, but there's another way of being called upon or appeal, yeah. receiving an appeal by someone that calls me to this other dimension of a normative order um, uh, that then allows me maybe to also entertain some kind of a second person standpoint we are that, that Steve is describing. But that is that has a richer dimension, and um, in some sense, I also thought that it's important that this kind of um, being caught into a normative order um, always is somehow in excess of this kind of uh, contractual relation of the second person right. standpoint, and always drags me beyond this kind of, uh, 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 or I mean, at least exceeds the type of reasons that are that are there. That that was one thing that I was wondering. Whether, yeah. whether you think that it somehow exceeds this, transgresses this, or gives this a certain energy that points beyond this kind of uh, uh, interpersonal uh, yeah, I arrangement. Mean, uh, the, uh, I, I see that, that the acknowledging the originary claim, I'm sure, um, uh, is what opens me out onto the demand uh, for giving and asking for reasons into that. So, so it's what enables the second person standpoint. Right. When I'm in the second person standpoint, what is that? That's, I mean, I'm just going to take Steve's exemplary analysis of it. I'm, you know, uh, I, I'm treating others and, and the, the claims that can be valid within that standpoint are uh, predicated on my treating others as, and myself as essentially interchangeable. Right? As rational, really nothing but rational beings, if you want to put it that way. So, uh, with the relations of symmetry. And uh, there are only some parts of our lives where the relations of symmetry of that kind are dominant, really, and are important. And uh, I mean, now here I'm treading on thin ice, I suppose. Depends on how far down you think this sort of uh, moral symmetry uh, goes in every aspect of our lives. Um, but I would say that, that uh, all I need, or all I really wanted to try to do was say that it presupposes this other form of address, which also, um, uh, goes beyond establishing the rules for the second person standpoint, or, or establishing the conditions of possibility for the second person standpoint. Um, so I don't think, I'm not sure I answered the crux of your question, but does that help? Yeah, no, no, I think that, I think that's I mean, If one wanted to talk about how to get it, you know, I kind of think of it this way. Um, and if you're talking about Heidegger, not Levinas, but, uh, you know, there comes a point, I mean, you learn all this stuff from people, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of no, 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 and um, at some point, I mean, you know, Freud, Nietzsche, whatever you want to say, I mean, at some point, you know, that, that no uh, is, is, in a way, constitutive of you. It doesn't, it's not some external um, uh, command that, uh, you then get the idea that you can fight it with force. Right? It belongs to you in a certain way. And that that, that, that um, seems to me to be a phenomenon of conscience. And then uh, you can identify, I mean, there's, if I'm right, there's no identifying the addresser. You can say, well, OK, that's just the voice of the, the super ego, your parents, you know, internalized your parents' voice, and so on. But then you've missed the point. Then you really haven't taken it over as your own, and so you're uh, still outside of, you're still trying to escape normative space. Get me out of this prison. You know? Anyway, that's what we're going to do. I mean, 
with regard to the way you were just describing it now, I could uh, reformulate the question about the access in this way. The, the structure that this, uh, this original appeal has seems to, seems to have a different, different so, seems to imply a different social structure than the second person standpoint. So if you think about this type of first appeal as enabling this other type of second person standpoint, yeah. then it's the conditional possibility of it, but at, at the same time, in the very social structure that it, that it trades on, in tension with the kind of symmetry that is in place there. Yeah. So it, somehow the second person standpoint is enabled by an asymmetric second personal relation that you don't want to conceive of as somehow God's command or something, but in a different ma manner. Right. But it's still, it's an, in, it's an asymmetric appeal. That, that, and, and so this, this second person standpoint order relies on, a, on, an order, on a normative order structure of a different sort that is in possible tension. And so in yes. this sense, I think this other, if, this, if this other structure of appeal remains in place, kind of challenges or pushes the boundaries of this. Yeah, so I think that, that that other order, vertical order, you might say, so, right. um, uh, is uh, I, that's sort of how I think about it in terms of the dimension of the ideal. So that um, there's a certain, I'm drawn to, uh, to act in a certain way, you might say, uh, and, and that's to embrace a uh, to take a stand on what I think I ought to do, and that um, uh, can't it, it can't be drawn. I mean, this is what I mean by responsibility as answerability. By taking a stand in that way, I'm beholden to other people to give reasons about why I think these things are the best. So I. I it, there's a tension between what is actually you know, bandied about as the uh, the structure of the second person standpoint, right? The, the symmetrical structure, what I owe you, you owe me, and all this. Um, it's possible tension, but that, that tension is just the argumentative situation, right? It's I, I can't just withdraw. That was sort of the point of, I mean, we could talk about Abraham and all stuff here, but uh, I, I can't just withdraw uh, uh, from that um, obligation to justify my apologia, to justify myself in, 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 in terms of what I take to be best. And so that tension is just what we call political life, I guess, you know, social life. Um, you mentioned at some point that from the no, no, no's, you eventually reach, in some sense, the, the second person perspective, right? From, from this primordial phenomenon of, yeah. the, of the no, right? Yeah, I've kind of yeah, taken yeah. in the no. I mean, when I'm saying no, 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 I'm kind of thinking of my parents. You know, yeah, yeah, when yeah, I'm no. like two years old, go, don't put your hand over there. This I see, thing. I see. I see. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't want to take you too literally on that, but um, mm -hmm. what distinguishes, for instance, this, this in some sense, this experience of the inability to fulfill my needs with respect to a human's restrictions on me from the restrictions that might have been imposed on me by some very complex creature that is not, not in the sense of a wall that simply does not allow me to do something, but in some sense is also complicated and gives me some patterns of behavior that I would follow to, to be aligned with its needs. So to be aligned with the needs of some other person, of the, of that, no, of that like other creature. What distinguishes, in some sense, the restrictions imposed by something complicated but non-human, and the restrictions imposed by a human being? Why? Why is is the human being able to, to give me these primordial experiences that introduces me to the to the yeah, second yeah. person perspective, not this complicated creature? Yeah. Well, I, I, my my point was in moving from Levinas to Heidegger that uh, it's arbitrary in a certain oh, sense right, right. what you, you can't, in the phenomenon of conscience, there's no way to identify the addresser. And the addresser, you can. You're saying that's the voice of my parents, or it's God, or it's something else. But it's your own uh, interdiction of your own murderous freedom. But the you in question is the you accusative. You that's the point I want to say from Levinas, that you've received that, right? 
And so, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, that sort of constitutes your own self, uh, as a self, as a performative uh, being that's responsible to, for, for uh, what it does and, and for reasons and, and that kind of thing. And uh, there may be reasons why uh, in, in various, I mean, what would Levinas say? Like, why did he identify the other human being as the, the big O other? Why, why did he do that? Well, you, uh, you could say, well, the response to the other in the neutral or sense is uh, uh, answering or offering reasons, it's, it's language, because of the way that the, uh, introdu the introduction, wherever it came from, um, uh, uh, the precise way in which it restricts your freedom. So uh, why would Levinas say it's obviously the other human being? Um, well, because we only answer to other human beings. We, we speak with other human beings. And, um, you know, you can also say, well, you know, it's the difference between Judaism and Christianity. I mean, there's a lot of different things you could say, but if you wanted to try to, uh, to try to, um, I feel, the way I've tried to make sense of it is that uh, we have to leave it open, uh, but right now the only people we talk to are other people. That, that this is the community that's constituted by, by the command. So, but then language wouldn't be essential. Language is, would be essential. W would be essential? C can't I, for, for instance, in the Heideggerian argument, couldn't I answer to myself without language? Well, uh, I think that um, that what he, his, his, I mean, the language here doesn't mean simply that I say something. But, okay. uh, but uh, I think that my response to the call, when he calls taking over being the ground, is a kind of language because it takes those the factic grounds, as he puts it, uh, and turns them into justifying reasons. And in a way, Reasons are part of my bit sign. I mean, I, I owe them to others, and um, and whether I speak them out or not, or consider them as reasons, uh, I, I think that that's a, a deep uh, linguistic element in there. No questions. Thanks. So let's thank. Thank you. Thank you.